position. We'll take this last one, then we'll take a quick break so that we can have a little bit of a rest. So, um, uh, this, uh, Lindsay Bowker. So Lindsay, could you repeat that to the microphone so that the audience could hear what you just said? Yes. Yeah. May I greet the committee first? Please. Yeah. I want to say good morning and thank you to each of you who serve as Gotta citizens. Got to get closer. That thing doesn't pick up very well. I want to say good morning and thank you so much to each of you who serve as citizens on this board making substantive rules. It's a very unusual uh, precedent. And in 30 years of public service, myself as a high-level official often, I've testified written testimony, analyzed written legislation. And I said to my um, helper who managed to get me here today, because health is an issue for me, this is the first time in 68 years that I've ever testified as a citizen on an issue like this. And I'm honored that it's before our citizens' board. What I said to the uh, members of the board when I asked that they take the packet is at the back of the packet there's a chart I'll be referring to that's the actual risk assessment data on Bald Mountain from the Belieden study that was done in 1990. That mountain is relevant not just because J.D. Irving owns the mountain or owns the land, but because the uh, risks that we're lucky enough to have measured for us. Most states are not usually in this situation where they actually have this huge, rich volume of data in a state that hasn't had any actual mining. So the data that we're lucky enough to have on Bald Mountain tells us a lot, and I'm sure my uh, the associate here from Santec will um, attest that this is also very indicative of what we're likely to find at other main deposits, um, Mount Chase and um, Alder Pond, because they're in the same geologic deposit. We know that one end of that deposit, Elizabeth Mine in Vermont, a super fun site that um, Dr. Seal, Dr. Robert Seal, has just done a, a big piece of work on, has a similar geochemical profile to Bald Mountain, similarly very, very high risk. And we also know that a mountain at the other end of that geologic um, structure, um, the Brunswick 12 at Bathurst, which is a perpetual care mine, also has anomalously high risk. The kind of deposits that we have in Maine are called volcanogenic massive sulfides. And as a type of deposit, they're at the second highest risk category. So that's very different from the kind of mines they have in New Mexico, very different from the kind of mines they have in other parts of the world. Um, so that's a special risk category. And what this data on Ball Mountain tells us is that even in that second highest risk category, our mountain is off the charts anomalous. And that's the chart at the back that you don't need to refer to it now, but I'll, I'll give you a context for understanding that chart. Um, I am here today. I should explain who I am. Bowker Associates is a, a nonprofit in formation. We engage issues of um, potential massive economic consequence in the state of Maine with a view to informing all parties to bringing in-depth information that's normally not available to a legislator, member of a board, an environmental committee, a commissioner, um, because it takes a, just a huge amount of time to get that deeply into any one issue. So we only deal with one or two issues at a time so that we can really get deeply inside it. And the idea is to share that information with all parties um, to an issue, and that's, that's what we do. Um, so um, the issues that we've engaged to date, just to give you an example, are the Searsport tank, 
brought by DCP for the 22 million gallon um, LPG tank, um, Chenbro's East West Highway, JD Irving's rolling pipeline up back and through Maine, and the um, issues, are we ready for um, phase three of Callahan um, Superfund? Are we well informed? Are we looking in the right direction? And this issue, this revisitation of mining law and regulation, um, although prompted by um, J.D. Irving's um, interest in mining, is not about J.D. Irving's interest in mining. It's about the fact that our regulations, our statute, has to aim at a much higher benchmark than other states. The challenges that we have in Maine, just in the nature of our geology, as indicated by Bald Mountain, and um, I'm sure if you ask Robert Seal, who's done most of the work at Bald Mountain and, and most of the ARD work at the, at the uh, Elizabeth Mine in Vermont, will agree with me, and I'm sure the uh, consultant from uh, Santec will agree, that it's very likely that we'll see these same um, irregular, super high risks at our other sites. Although, of course, it varies within a site and within a deposit. Um, I had come here initially wanting to, to beg you to please not let this hearing become a revisitation of the, of the polarities. And I have to say, I've agreed with pretty much everything that both sides have said today. Um, a lot of very constructive information has come forward. Um, there's obviously a consensus that anti-mining is not a wise policy and that rhetoric and hype and um, uh, uninflated, unsupported promises are, are not something we need to do here today. The truth is we left the gate in the wrong direction and we're almost at the finish line and along the way, no course correction has happened. So what I wanted to do today is give you sort of some touchstones for how to look at this information and how to um, uh, understand really what our status quo is, both with respect to the statute and with respect to this law, as a package of um, is this is this a response that can really drive to the right decisions and make the, the, the most sensible decisions for the extremely high level of risk we have in Maine? Um, as a risk manager uh, looking at mining for the first time two years ago, I've done a lot of work and I was a risk manager for New York City DEP, which is one of the largest public utilities in the country and did a lot of work in um, on the third water tunnel that was my major risk management project and I thought I had seen it all done it all been to the outer edges of what risk management can even begin to try to pull under some kind of control but I have to say I've developed an incredibly healthy respect for metallic mining and sulfide ores compared to all other areas that have a risk or a public impact that um, affect the public interest and bring them under law and regulation. As a risk manager, I tell you that mining, metallic mining in sulfide ores involves much more uncertainty than is usually present in any other kind of business decision or any other kind of regulatory decision. It involves more severe consequences from errors and unexpected failures than almost any other endeavor that we might undertake as a society for any reason. It involves the least opportunity for recovery from failure. Several other um, uh, speakers this morning have uh, spoken to that very eloquently. Um, and it's absolutely true. A mistake in mining, if you let the acid start and you let the uh, toxic metals leaching begin, it's almost impossible to mitigate, control, correct, or undo. It's almost an irreversible error. So the whole structure has to drive towards understanding that risk from the very, very beginning and understanding where you can go in that mine, how you can go in that mine, what you have to do, and can you do it? Um, 
Mr. Fitzgerald uh, mentioned no-go zones. Uh, that's, a, that's a very important concept because what Belieden concluded in 1990, and Belieden was the world's leading expert in um, mining in volcanic massive sulfides. They also were very accustomed to doing that under incredibly strict Swedish regulations. They were like the perfect, the perfect company for Bald Mountain. They hired the very best um, environmental consultant then and now, SRK. So all the data that we have on Bald Mountain came from the very highest possible. I mean, you couldn't ask for, for a, a higher benchmark of quality in terms of the um, trustworthiness of the observations and the opinions. I'm the one that acquired the data that everybody's been looking at, and it took me a very long time, I have to tell you, to finally get it out. And I happened to miss the report that NRCM um, um, pulled and cited in their recent report. I was focused on the scientific information, the geochemical data, the actual risk data, because that's my focus. And I think a lot of you know from my distribution list, I've been circulating and interpreting and analyzing that information for everybody since June. When I saw the document that Pete Didesheim and um, Nick Bennett pulled from that file, a document that I missed, I almost fell over because there was what I've been wanting all along and begging for all along. There was an opinion by SRK still to this day, the top, 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 top environmental consultant in mining, saying that in 1990, Belieden's plan, which was an open pit top to bottom excavation, was outside the bounds of any known technology at that time, that it could not be accomplished without degradation outside the area, significant degradation, in plain English. Um, and the truth about mining technology is on the risk side, there hasn't really been that much new. Nothing can change the geology of a mountain. So to say that uh, data from 1990 about the risks at Bald Mountain is not relevant to this rulemaking or not relevant to our consideration is both unwise and untrue. It's very relevant. The geology of that mountain, and most likely the geology of our other mountains, is permanent. Neutralizing potential doesn't rain down from heaven like mana. Um, sulfurs that generate acid don't turn into oats. And arsenic doesn't just transmute magically into something else. Those are inherent risks in the deposit itself, and they're still there. The advances that have taken place in technology and mining have not really addressed the risk side at all. What they have addressed is ways to extract metals that make attacking a mountain like ours that has a comparatively low grade of ore more economically feasible. And perhaps in that equation somewhere there's more money to do the extra measures that you have to take to address the risk. But the job that we're trying to accomplish here with our statute and our regulations is about how do you pull those two things together? And I think we've heard a consensus here this morning from almost everybody that spoke and that said that's really what it's all about. It's not about anti-mining. It's not about prohibiting mining. It's about good government and it's about building a legal structure and a regulatory structure that pulls this together in a responsible way. Some of you may uh, know, I, I don't know whether uh, Ms. Bertocci circulated my letter, but I petitioned you all not to accept this rule. Um, I didn't think it was even close to being worthy uh, of our time and effort in commenting on it and bringing it before you. Um, I still believe that. I, I, I don't believe it. It's not a matter of belief. It's, it's, it's a fact. It, it needs work. We're not anywhere near there. So I urge you, please, to seek outside guidance. Mining is so complex and, and, and so risky and involves so many really esoteric parameters to even consider that a board of citizens, even though I'm sure you each did your homework 
I'm sure you've been anticipating this for 18 months, so I'm sure you've been hitting Google like everybody else and trying to learn as much as you can and understand as much as you can. Um, I've put in a thousand hours, and I and I was a, a risk management expert with a heavy construction background, and I'm floored by its complexity. And there are people out there that can help you, and I ask you, I ask you, I beg you, before you make any decision on this rule at all, that you reach out and retain one of those experts who's highly respected by the mining industry and who's also willing to serve NGOs and government agencies. The first list is a very big list. <laughs> the second list is a very small list because almost everybody makes all their money from, from uh, serving the mining industry. And I've put in probably several hundred hours doing outreach into the industry to find out you know, who would be willing to serve us? Who would be willing to help us, you know, with the risk management companies for, for mining companies be willing to work for the state of Maine or willing to enter a requirements contract with the state of Maine? Most wouldn't um, without some outreach. But there are two or three people that, that uh, really understand this issue from both sides. And David Chambers, who came before the entire legislative committee last year, in my opinion, is the only person that can help you. Um, he is uh, highly regarded by uh, the mining industry. Um, he's worked on, he's an expert in perpetual care, which is one of the recurring issues that keeps coming up here. And I wanted to say one little word about perpetual care before the end of that. And he's, um, he's done, worked with land use. He's worked with the concept of go, no-go zones. In fact, he invented it. Um, not uh, for uh, an American regulator, but for um, uh, zones like the Amazon and things like that. He wrote an international responsibility uh, of mining guideline that's universally highly regarded. Um, I'm not uh, suggesting you hire and you rewrite the statute and the regs. I'm asking you, begging you to please uh, enter uh, a contract with him to read our statute, read our regs, and also read our 1991 regs, which are every bit as much a disaster. Those aren't good regs. They don't protect anything. They, and, they, and they don't tell a mining applicant how to get from A to Z. Anybody that's going to invest the kind of money you have to invest in mining needs to know, how am I going to get from A to Z? What's, you know, what, what's the deal? We don't have that. Um, so I beg you to please uh, look to David if he's available, or I could give you some other uh, suggestions. A very short list. Houston Kempton is another. Uh, Robert Moran is another. But uh, I really think uh, David's your guy. I just want to say uh, one tiny thing on this perpetual care, this 30-year versus 7-year. That's not what it's all about. Perpetual care is one of the f uh, five foundational policies of a modern mining policy. And what perpetual care aims at from the very beginning, which is the whole point of what I'm telling you, from the very beginning right up front, develops a mine plan, a plan for management of all the materials that are going to come out of that mine plan, such that at closure you have a documentally, a documentable, scientifically supported, reasonable anticipation of a self-sustaining natural habitat restored to its original functions and characteristics. That's, that's the aim of, of all the policy around perpetual care. So yeah, it may take seven years. I mean, I, I think it's the Green Creek Mine in um, Alaska. Um, it's, it's taken them seven years of water treatment to finally attain that level. But the point about that mine is it was built and designed from day one, from the earliest, earliest, earliest time to avoid problems. Those are the two key things, risk avoidance and loss prevention. Those, those are the hallmark things. At the back of my, um, I just want to, if you could just take a, Oh, I just have one one more quick thing. Okay. I appreciate your testimony, but I, I right. can't on one side of the Right. 
So the other pillars, the other pillars of the other five pillars that must be in this a policy that you can use as touchstone in addition to the uh, perpetual care issue are it has to have uh, an ARD uh, management plan that's required that guides every decision from the very earliest time. It's not a matter of waiting to see what kind of waste is piled up on your site and, and then uh, dividing it up into classes and deciding what to do with it safely. It begins at exploration and advanced exploration, which, by the way, is just as risky, and that was acknowledged by Santec. I, I agree with everything uh, Santec said. But you, you still have to have the risk assessment because those big holes in a mountain like Bald Mountain will, and I believe right now, are generating acid that the mountain would not have generated by itself. The other policy foundation that is not clearly in our statute and definitely not addressed or central to this rule is called neutral drainage. Neutral drainage means uh, Nothing that leaves this site in any manner whatsoever, whether it's through surface runoff, through groundwater, uh, not just discharges, um, it can, can leave the site in a state of contamination. That's the policy found framework for the MEN program in Canada, which was available as a reference when we wrote our 1991 rules. Our thing here isn't even close. The other two really critically important things are our criteria for the selection of applicants. One of the first things Dr. Price told me when he was so generous to uh, spend time with me when I first took up this issue, and he is without question the gold standard for regulation on, on mining. He said Maine should not be taking up any consideration of mining unless it's committed to creating a mining specific highly qualified, equally expert to the mining operator staff. I respect the 150 years of talent on uh, DEP's um, team, and I respect the work that they've done. But that work is not in mining. Geology is not mining. It's, 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 it's an entirely separate field. Um, and we should follow uh, Dr. Dr. Price's uh, wise advice. And the other is the criteria of the applicant. The applicant working in a mine like Bald Mountain, or any mountain, whatever mountain it is that turns up for us, um, has to have relevant experience in that kind of deposit, in that same climate, and has to have a working knowledge and a working familiarity with the whole range of technology that can be reasonably applied in that climate, and have demonstrated that he can put those things together uh, with a, a mine that is going to meet those other criteria of uh, self-sustaining post-care and neutral drainage. Uh, if you keep those touchstones in mind, which are outlined more clearly than perhaps I've said them in my oral testimony, um, I think we'll end up at the right place, and most especially if you seek uh, David Chambers' help. I thank you very much, and I thank you all.
several legislators here who have business to attend to this afternoon, so I'm going to uh, take them out of, sort of out of turn so that they can say what they need to say, and then because uh, they need to get back uh, to some other business. Um, I will say, and as you can tell, this is going to become lengthy. Um, I'm going to ask if you could please hold your comments to you know three, five minutes if you can. If you have testimony, that is helpful. We want that. Uh, anything you have you want to add to the record afterwards, the you have to the 28th to submit it. We appreciate that. Um, and you know, it's going to be a long day. And if we get much past 5 o'clock, uh, the mind starts to shut down. So um, what I would ask is, and if you, if you can't stay um, because you have commitments elsewhere, I know some people have traveled far. If you have written testimony, please bring it up. It will get distributed to all the members. We will have it on, on the record. And again, you have till the 28th to submit additional written, uh, written information for us to consider. So I appreciate your indulgence. Um, we will probably be breaking about 12.30 for lunch. We'll reconvene and uh, continue to try to uh, get through all this. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to start with uh, Representative Jeff McCabe. Chairman Foley, members of the Board of Environmental Protection, uh, it's always a great way to uh, deflect some attention to have a politician go after the break and cut some other folks in line. So I appreciate that and I welcome that. Uh, so thank you all for being here. I know this, this is not an easy subject and uh, you folks are, are used to a little bit of controversy. So uh, I applaud your efforts there and I appreciate you being here and being so open to hear these comments. Um, I do have a lengthy testimony, but I decided I'd narrow that down because a lot of it can actually be read, and I do want to spare your time. It is, it is, and there's some background information there as well. I did want to touch upon, there were some comments earlier in regards to uh, LD 1843, in regards to that original bill um, that did come up late in the session. It was a 9-4 report out of the committee. It was a... Um, a close vote, you could say. In the House, it was uh, 78 for, 65 against, uh, and that was bipartisan as well. In the Senate, it was 21, 14, uh, bipartisan both ways. So it's not too often that you see votes like that in the House. This being my third term, uh, I, I did appreciate some of the discussion around the political reality. Uh, this is an issue that isn't a partisan issue. Um, it's becoming an issue that isn't a north and south issue because it truly is a statewide issue. And I believe you had mentioned that we aren't talking about one specific location. And I just want to echo and agree with that. We really are talking about statewide policy. And I think that's important that we do take that 10,000 foot view and look at this as statewide policy. So I applaud that and I try to stay to the 10,000 foot view as much as possible. But um, the reality is, is in the House, uh, you know, we, we had a bill, I was a sponsor of the bill, LD1302, that would have required DEP to add provisions in the rules that uh, would have greatly improved them. I've attached a copy of the majority report for 1302 to my testimony, and uh, I just want to draw your attention that, that that bill passed overwhelmingly in the House. That was a 9740 vote, and unfortunately that bill failed in the Senate by only three votes. So that, you know, is sort of the reality. It's also the political reality. Uh, that bill is attached. I encourage you folks to look at that. After the session, a bipartisan group of 14 of my colleagues from the House and the Senate sent a, a letter to Commissioner Aho to ask to incorporate key provisions of 1302 into the draft rules. Um, you have that letter as well. There are some bulleted points, numbered points as far as those. Uh, unfortunately, Commissioner Ajo only incorporated one of those provisions in the draft rule. It was a very important provision, but only one of those was included. So I'm here today to ask you folks to strengthen the rules, to really look at the third party certification, to really look at the financial assurance, and make sure there is significant money to pay the full cost of closure and remediation. I also ask you to look and to come up with a way 
to make sure that any company in the state of Maine that is looking to do mining will actually verify the estimates on the number of jobs. I think all too often we have a history of these types of projects inflating the number of jobs that will be created. And I think it's really important that if we are going to do mining in the state of Maine, that we actually have some accurate statistics as far as it goes for employment numbers. So I encourage you folks to look at that. I also encourage you to look at the DEP rules and look at whether or not 10-year post-closure treatment is appropriate. I think you'll see that we struggled with that, and I hope that this committee will take a long, hard look at that 10-year number and figure out what the adequate number is. And I think for us going forward, I think it's hopeful, or I am hopeful, that this group will do the work that's necessary to improve these rules so that when it does come back to the legislature, it's as clean and thoughtful a process as possible. I think the worst case scenario is that it comes back to the legislature and that these rules fail and we're back at square one. I think that moving forward, there's an opportunity here to move forward and I encourage this group to do this and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. The next uh, representative Grant. Good morning, um, Chairman Foley, uh, members of the BDP, um, Commissioner. Um, I am a representative from District House District 59, Gardner and Randolph, here in Central Maine. I'm a brand new member of the legislature and I serve on the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. Um, when I uh, became a member of the committee, I made it my task to learn everything I could about mining in Maine and what happened in the previous session, the 125th, so that I could start with a level of respect for the work that had been done before. And um, I found that really interesting, and I found some of it a little bit alarming. And um, when uh, LD 1302 was uh, submitted, as uh, Rep Representative McCabe just uh, spoke to you about, um, I looked at it very carefully, and I'm one of the signers of the letter that he shared with you, a group of 15 bipartisan uh, representatives and senators who had some specific concerns about the current law upon which these rules are based. Understanding, as we all do, that the rules are only going to be as good as the framework upon which they are based. And the DEP staff has done an excellent job of providing you rules based on the requirements of that law. Some of us felt that some of those requirements were not stringent enough. They didn't strike the right balance of uh, protecting the environment, protecting human health, and um, so we had those areas of concern, one of which was addressed uh, in the rules <coughs> before you. So I just would only echo um, that when you do your work and you respond to all that you're hearing, and, um, and, I, and again, I thank you for that work, it will be easier for us in the 126 to do our job if you can um, really take a thorough look at the background of this, and I know you will. Um, because we really don't want all the work and the money uh, that has gone into where we are now to be uh, wasted. Uh, we'll all be back at square one. And that, it was our hope that LD 1302 would strike that right balance and provide us an opportunity to look at mining in Maine in a safe way. And the, we're really convinced that the technology exists. And if you have an opportunity, I would also echo um, someone raised that earlier, Dr. Chambers, um, that, who was mentioned earlier, came and spoke to the ENR committee, and I found his information really helpful. Um, so if you do have a chance to review uh, any of that or, or have an opportunity to have him come before you, I think it'd be really, really helpful. So um, I would just uh, ask you to take into consideration those concerns, and um, I, I wish you well in, in your work. We will be following you, and, uh, and, and we know how complicated this is. So I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank, Thank you. you very much. <coughs> Chapman?
Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair Foley and uh, gentle people of the committee and others. My name is Ralph Chapman from Brooksville in Hancock County. I represent House District 37, the only House district in Maine that has had any metal mining in it in the last 95 years. My hometown is the town that has the Callahan Mine. The largest town in my district, the town of Blue Hill, has the Kerr American Mine, formerly known as the Black Hawk Mine. I want to give you just a very brief history of those two mines. I don't want to take a lot of your time. I'd be happy to answer your questions now or at any time. But uh, there are a few pieces of information that I think you need to have. Uh, so the first mine to operate was the Callahan Mine uh, opening in 1968 through 1972. It's an open pit mine. Uh, it's an EPA Superfund site at the present time. A couple of weeks ago, the, the work was completed to remove the acute health hazard on the site, which was a massive contamination of the soils of polychlorinated biphenols or PCBs. Um, and that work was just completed a couple of weeks ago. Almost simultaneously, another report from the research group at Dartmouth uh, was released that discussed uh, some heavy metal contamination studies that they had done in the estuary next to the mine uh, that uh, shows uh, evidence suggesting that there's a, a still an ongoing uh, unknown source of heavy metal contamination into the surface waters uh, in, the, in the area of the mine. Uh, now, uh, I want to make a comment about what the EPA plan is. They just completed this phase one. The next phase is to deal with stabilizing the tailings and putting an impervious cover, uh, water impervious cover over the tailings, uh, and to put some of the waste rock back into the pit. Uh, when that is completed the estimated cost prior to the discovery last year of the PCB widespread contamination, the estimated cost was $23 million. The state of Maine taxpayers are liable for about 10% of that. So Maine taxpayers have been paying about $2.3 million. Uh, when all of that is done, and the estimated time is another five to 10 years, uh, then not a single penny will have been spent to deal with the groundwater contamination and uh, for an obvious reason, which is there is no known technology to do so at the present time. Now the second mine to operate in my district was the uh, Black Hawk Mine, now called the Kerr American Mine in Blue Hill. That started in 1972 and went to 1976. Uh, that was the mine that was estimated to be uh, had promised to employ two to three hundred people for ten to twenty years, and it it did uh, about ten percent of that. It was the actual employment. Um, I should say, speaking of jobs in the mines, that these mines have created lots of jobs, and, and some of them fairly decent paying jobs. It's just that the jobs came forty years later in the guise of uh, remediation work to be done on the mines. The jobs at the time were very low paying jobs and of course only temporary. So uh, the Kerr American mine uh, is not uh, on the uh, taxpayer uh, uh, dole at the moment. It's, it's, uh, uh, it was possible to identify a party responsible for it. Uh, and so about uh, half a dozen years ago, uh, when it was found that the uh, I, I, should, I should back up here for a second. In, in, after the Callahan mine got started, the legislature decided that we should have a, a reclamation act, something to have uh, mining companies sort of fix up the mine site before they leave it. And so when the, when the, Kerm, uh, the Callahan mine was exempted from that, but it, it, for the Blackhawk mine, um, 
a cover was put over the tailings, but it was not uh, engineered in a way which would last. And so when that eroded and it was discovered that five or six tons per year of dissolved heavy metals were leaching from the tailings into the local surface water and biota, uh, a geosynthetic cover was installed about half a dozen years ago at a cost of approximately $10 million. If that geosynthetic cover works, and at last reports I hadn't gotten the data from the DEP monitoring, uh, I, I gather staffing issues have uh, had, the, had the group busy. Uh, um, but it, if that cover works, it will require perpetual care to maintain it. That is to say, you know, if you let a tree grow on a spot, the tree roots puncture the geosynthetic cover that defeats the, the, its purpose. So um, that's the situation with the two mines. Uh, I, I just have a few comments now on the role of your uh, group looking at the proposed regulations. And it would seem to me that it would be worthwhile to ask the hypothetical question of if the proposed regulations were in force at the time that these mines uh, were operated, would the situation be different today? I think that's a worthwhile question as a form of focusing the thinking on how the regulations actually affect what, what happens. So let me indicate what the problems are with the mines, uh, both the Callahan mine and the uh, Kerr American mine. Uh, one, I've mentioned already the acute health hazard from the pollution. Uh, the other is, of course, the chronic health hazard from the uh, uh, heavy metal um, uh, contamination and uh, both surface water and, of course, groundwater. Uh, because of the contamination of the groundwater, uh, that results in a loss of future use. The Callahan mine site, uh, the current owner is trying to give it to the town, but <laughs> I, I understand that the area can never be used for residential or commercial purposes. You cannot sink a well into that area ever. So it's, it's forever not developable. Uh, the same is true, of course, of the underground mine in Blue Hill. Uh, you can't sink a well into, uh, into the region that has the underground mine. Um, so that's a loss of future use. Uh, and then I, I mentioned uh, the perpetual care that's required. As I say, at the Callahan mine, the impervious cover has not yet been placed on the tailings. That's part of the next five to 10 year job that the EPA uh, is planning to do. That will require perpetual care as well. And then there's, of course, the cost of the taxpayers. Now, let's focus quickly then on what the regulations before you have to say about these things. Uh, let's deal with the cost of taxpayers first. The dollar value determination for the uh, trust fund is, is uh, ambiguous. It's ambiguous because how do you know what it's going to cost in the future? Uh, how do you estimate what it's going to cost in the future? You heard excellent testimony just before the break detailing the uncertainties of the industry. And so this is a particular problem uh, of uh, trying to determine what dollar value to put into the trust fund, and then the release of funds is uh, up to the department. Now, here's the real problem. The real problem isn't the known pollution. The real problem is what I'll call the delayed pollution. I mentioned the study from Dartmouth that was just released a couple of weeks ago relative to the Callahan mine. That suggests to me the possibility, I, by the way, I, I'm not a mining expert. I, I am one of the few published uh, research scientists in the legislature, and my background is in applied physics, but it's not mining. But I, so I, I, I don't want to suggest that I'm speaking with authority on, uh, on these uh, mining issues, but I at least raise the question that if, the, if some of the acid mine drainage acid rock drainage uh, is observable only after a period of time, then m saying that everything is okay uh, on one day doesn't mean that uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, it's still okay. This is the major problem. It looks as though there is a, uh, a time delay between when 
when you expose this material that's been out of the environment for hundreds of millions of years, and then you expose it to the environment, it may take a little while before it creates the problem that we're trying to avoid. So that means the determination for the cost of the, you know, I don't use the phrase cleanup because I, 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 that, that's not, a, it just, you cannot clean it up. You, you remediate it as best you can. Uh, it's not like a, spilling a, a, a glass of milk on the table and then you get the sponge and, you know, a few minutes later you're basically back to where you were except that you've lost the glass of, you, you've lost the milk. A cleanup with re respect to one of these mines uh, uh, just means putting it into a state in which it's, uh, uh, you know where the pollution is and you're trying to keep it from, uh, from affecting the health of people around it. Uh, so uh, I want to mention one other issue dealing with the Kerr American mine because it's an issue that is not discussed in your regulations, proposed regulations, and has been discussed uh, almost uh, not at all uh, before the Committee of Jurisdiction in the legislature, and that has to do with selling liabilities. Uh, the Kerr American mine liability was sold to a liability management company. Now, if that is how the industry works, has worked, or is intending to work, then your regulations don't pertain to how the sold liabilities are going to be assessed by uh, the department as to whether the liability management company is capable uh, has the assets, the resources, and so forth to, uh, to manage those liabilities. So that's an issue that uh, is, is, of course, missing. Now, I, just a couple of very other brief comments. Um, the concept that the 1991 regulations was what kept the lack of mines in the last 20 years has to be looked in the con historical context. There was a 50-year period from 1918 to 1968 in which there were no metal mines in Maine and there were no regulations. And so to su suggest that a 20-year period of no mines was due to the 1991 regulations is uh, perhaps uh, inaccurate. Um, and finally, the population of Arusta County uh, peaked in 1940, the, the region, uh, some, several earlier uh, people testifying uh, made reference to that and has been in decline for the last uh, uh, 60, 70 years. The population in my district peaked in 1880 and fell continuously until 1960. It was an 80-year period of declining population. My district, although reasonably average state in terms of the state, in terms of its economy at the present time, uh, was a, uh, a economically depressed area. The people in my district welcomed with open arms the announcement of the opening of the mine on account of the jobs it was going to create. Uh, if you graph the population as a function of time for those two regions of the state, they have a, a, a surprisingly similar shape, just offset by uh, uh, 60 years. So uh, I, I want to bring that to your attention that I, I, I feel for the needs of the people in uh, Arusta County for economic development. Um, uh, and I uh, think that uh, as a final comment, I'd like to second very heartily all of the comments that were made by the speaker just before the break, uh, Lindsay uh, uh, Bowker, who had uh, um, presented a basic concept that this is a time to do it right and get the best information you can, uh, make that available to yourselves, uh, because to do any less is going likely to be a disaster. I would not like to see another Callahan mine or Black Hawk or Kerr American mine in the state of Maine. Thank you.
morning, Chairman Foley and, and members of the Board of Environmental Protection. I thank you for the opportunity to comment on the DEP's draft metallic mining rules. I'm Senator Chris Johnson representing Senate District 20. A significant part of Maine's economy depends on the pristine character of its natural places, the wholesome quality of life here, the fishing destinations, the wildlife, the strong conservation ethic here matter to those who visit, own a house or camp here, or call Maine home. We take seriously any threats to these qualities and these places because losing them would diminish Maine as a place to live and as a destination and in the process bring irreparable harm to our economy. I've heard from many of constituents concerned about the mining law and rule changes. Many of my constituents live on or make a living from or live here to enjoy our lakes, ponds, streams, and rivers. They include guides, trout fishermen, clammers, oyster aquaculturists, hikers, farmers, rockweed harvesters, commercial camp and resort operators, and conservation association or land trust members. All are dependent upon the unpolluted quality of those resources and the wildlife and natural beauty found among them here in Maine. I count myself with them among those concerned citizens. Let's talk for a moment about the dangers of sulfide ore metallic mining. Air and water such as rainfall combined with this ore, whether the exposed working surface or the tailings, create sulfuric acid drainage. And because the ore has high concentrations of arsenic and other toxic metals, that too is contained in the acid drainage. So in addition to the mountaintop ripped away to expose the ore, we have a seriously lethal wastewater drainage that must be contained and processed for not only the life of the mine, but until the mine is closed in such a way as to prevent rainfall from finding its way through the ore or tailings. Think for a moment about what that means to cap an open pit mine which is a vast hole in the ground where a mountaintop once was. Any of the sulfuric acid or arsenic and other toxic metals which find their way via wastewater into groundwater means that groundwater is no longer fit for drinking, farming, or any other use without expensive treatment. And in Maine, our groundwater connects quickly to surface water, so such lethal groundwater pollutants also threaten streams, lakes, and rivers, and all the aquatic life and other wildlife <laughs> or people that depend on them for water and food. Which is why we need far more than wishful thinking. We need strong protections to prevent the tragic destruction and loss of economic value of acid mine drainage, polluting groundwater and surface water, eventually killing all evolved life forms in its path. Nothing less than the best protections possible, the best practices will do. Because our quality of place, our reputation, our livelihoods, and potentially people's lives are all at stake if the protections are not good enough. That's why the draft mining rules are inadequate. They're incomplete. They're not good enough for Maine because we take the quality and character of our natural places and our water seriously, just as our visitors do, and as we expect it to remain for our children and grandchildren. Mine operators have a history of going bankrupt and leaving taxpayers with tremendous cleanup bills. So the rules should reflect that and require full payment of reclamation and closure costs before mine construction. Payment of that financial assurance into a trust must be verified by a third party retained by the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Anything less is not new due diligence given the track record of the mining industry company could be bankrupt in less than five years, and requiring only half those costs up front is irresponsible. This has happened before in Maine, leaving Superfund sites that still aren't cleaned up. And Maine people are not so gullible as to trust future mine operators without adequate financial assurances, and we expect our state agencies to be equally savvy. I have no idea why the draft rules allow 30 years of water treatment after closure. If best practices are followed, then 10 years is more than enough. We even put a man on the moon in less time than that. Frankly, I have to believe that if adequate closure and reclamation is precluded, sir, excuse me, if adequate 
closure and reclamation to preclude any further need of treatment can't be accomplished in 10 years, then the mine wasn't designed and operated with an adequate grasp on how it ever could be properly closed. And that's not what I call best practice. Unnecessarily long post-closure wastewater treatment will only encourage poor practices under the assumption that 30 years is long enough for someone to figure out how to fix what they've done. Or if they don't, then it will be someone else's problem. Our natural places, our water resources, our economy and health shouldn't be contaminated, nor should Maine taxpayers be left the cost of finishing cleanup by operators who run out of closure and reclamation money while running out the clock. Rules should not allow permitting of mines which plan longer than 10 years of wastewater treatment. Large-scale groundwater contamination greatly increases the closure costs and the risk that containment measures will be inadequate, leading to highly toxic contamination of waterways, wildlife, and people's water. The rules should establish a default distance of 100 feet for compliance monitoring wells. The same requirement is for landfills, unless the applicant demonstrates that an alternative distance would be more effective. In short, the rules need to get serious about best practices. The rules should require each applicant to include how best practices employed by mines of similar ores elsewhere, which have fully lived up to their environmental impact statements, will be applied here in Maine. Let's require those best practices to cover air quality and water quality monitoring, containment, treatment, and closure, and reclamation. We need to do it right or not do it at all. Because Maine's slogan is not, I remember it before the acid and arsenic spoiled it. <laughs> Our slogan is the way life should be, and that's the way it should stay. Thank you. Now I'm going to go back to the testimony in support of. Um, and again, we will be breaking at uh, 1230 for lunch. Um, so uh, again. Excuse me, could we just, um, with the time remaining before lunch, uh, divide evenly uh, against and for? I'm not sure. Well, I have been taking testimony against all since first early this morning. I, I know, but I think the time was about even though, um, between against and for, and I would like that if possible oh. now too. Uh, I'm going back to the people oh, in support oh, oh, of. I, I understand, but um, could you then come back to the for, against the for lunch? Um, that's a change in some part. Yeah, preferential treatment when no one's going to get there before lunch. Uh, uh, please, folks, yeah. I'm running this meeting, please. I'm not going to change my rules or my regulations based on somebody's need. If you have to get out, you can leave your testimony, you can supply it afterwards. Or you can be a congressman. Yeah. <laughs> the legislator can get ahead. Yeah. I, I would just like I, 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 Excuse me. I understand. I have a uh, I've Jeff gotten. McBurney. Chairman Foley, I just want to uh, call me, your sir. attention. I'm sorry. I, I need your name. No, I, I'm not going to take it. I'm sorry. I, I have a gentleman here that is going to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Commissioner Ajo. Uh, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak uh, on the proposed draft regulations as they pertain to uh, excuse me, metallic mineral mining. And I also appreciate this opportunity to participate in uh, what has been to now a very uh, passionate yet uh, civil discourse. Uh, my name is Jeff McBurney. I'm Director of Permitting and Regulatory Affairs for Casella Organics of Portland, Maine. I actually reside in Holden, Maine. And for full disclosure, I was born and raised in Washburn, Maine, and spent many of my uh, uh, formative years in the North Maine woods. Casella Organics annually manages nearly 800,000 tons of organic mineral uh, residuals, more than 50% of which are uh, beneficially used. Through its 30-year history, Casella Organics has participated in the successful reclamation of uh, more than 60 landfills and sand and gravel pits. Uh, I am here today, of course, speaking in support of the rules, but uh, by the same token, uh, while we support the rules, we feel there are room 
there's room for improvement for certain sections where additional development would be helpful. Uh, more specifically, I'm here to ask that you consider enhancing a very actual small uh, section of the rules. It takes up a page, basically, but it's actually a very important section. It's that on the reclamation and associated uh, with the closure. And ask that you enhance that to provide better guidance on restoring the mine land to its pre-mining state, both in short term and in perpetuity. Uh, we appreciate and support the use of performance-based standards rather than prescriptive standards. We often see prescriptive standards as not being compatible with all situations, maybe even uh, exacerbate problems. Performance-based standards allow for flexibility and provide options for achieving an end result that a rule might require. This is not a new concept. For years, contractors have worked uh, with erosion and sedimentation control best management practices in their construction activities. In simple terms, the performance standard is don't create erosion, don't create sedimentation, and then they provide guidance on how to achieve that standard. Uh, a similar approach is logical for reclaiming disturbed lands from mineral extraction. It's just like saying, if, if your guidance is restore the grade and restore appropriate vegetation, that's the standard, but there's not enough guidance there. Now, this is not something that we would need to create from scratch. Uh, many states, especially those in the western U.S., uh, have a significant experience in uh, mine land reclamation, as do on the east coast states like Kentucky and Pennsylvania. Uh, some of them have come to the table uh, kicking and screaming. Others have been fairly proactive in the development of their, their guidance. Uh, in my testimony, uh, and I apologize, I only included one set, but it was a 161-page document, so I figured I'd save a few trees. Um, it actually has a fairly clear um, framework for uh, developing best management practices. This is from the state of Utah, uh, from Utah's uh, oil, gas, and mining <coughs> operations, uh, and it speaks to a lot of things that should be considered as, as goals and standards for mine land rec reclamation, yet uh, provides many different tools to achieve that. Uh, it's not 100% adoptable, as you sh could expect, be coming from a different region, and it also has certain practices in there that are, are going to be uh, prohibited under Maine law, things such as uh, the heat piles or the, the leach piles. Uh, nevertheless, it provides an excellent guide to helping the state of Maine develop their uh, guidance for the reclamation process. So in, in quick summary, I just want to again encourage uh, the department uh, through the guidance of the board that they give due consideration to the tools that will be available to implement and enforce reclamation, reclamation of mined lands. And again, uh, it's important to understand that uh, what you see after one year of reclamation uh, does not really describe what can happen in year three, seven, ten, or thirty. So there is a need for uh, oversight to ensure that the, it's a proper and long-term uh, reclamation. So to the highest point, uh, highest level possible guidance on reclamation should provide adequate direction for restoring disturbed lands while allowing the mining operation flexibility with regard to how to achieve complete long-term site restoration. I thank you for your time. Yes, I, I gave my comments and I also included one copy of the, uh, the guidance for uh, reclamation. Any questions by the board? Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Next. Teresa Fowler. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, I think is more appropriate. Uh, Chairman Foley, Commissioner Aho, the, the Department of Environmental Board. Thank you to all of you for working so diligently, and particularly to the Department of Environment for working so diligently on these rules and regulations as they have been presented. I am the, my name is Teresa Fowler. I'm the Executive Director of the Central Aroostook Chamber of Commerce, which represents 13 communities in Central Aroostook, including Portage Lake, Ashland, Oxbow, and Masardis, the communities closest to and most affected by potential mining in that area. I'm not going to talk about the rules or Ball Mountain particularly. I'm talking about the necessity for the state of Maine to move forward and not stagnate business. Um, many people have spoken about the economic situation of our county and of other areas of the state. 
we know that we need to allow more uh, industry, be more business friendly, and I think that through, through these legislations, um, we will achieve that goal. One of the things that has not been mentioned, I don't think it yet today, is the fact that the minerals that are evident in, throughout the state are used in our everyday life. Presently, they are being mined in other locations, third world countries, with few regulations, um, and we are importing those to use in materials and equipment that we use on a daily basis. So would, would it not be better for us to be able to control the receipt and the, the uh, excavation of those minerals? I think that is basically my issue. Um, in support of the proposal from the Irving Corporation for this mining, I have also attached to my present, my documentation, some indications of their economic um, concern or their environmental concern for their operations. I would like to remind people that they are one of the largest agricultural operators in the state of Maine. They produce not only trees but potatoes. And in our survey of our members, um, because obviously I could not be here representing the 300 and some businesses that I do uh, without, without their support, it was unanimous support for development. And included in that were some of the major agricultural producers um, in the area. So I think the message that I'm bringing to you from Central Aroostook County is we encourage you to move forward with these rules and regulations, many hours and much money has been spent on them. We hope that they will be usable and that we will be able to move forward with this development, um, which in our mind is essential to our county. Thank you. Thank you, we'll be back at one o'clock.